Welcome to our podcast, where we discuss and meet with people, businesses, and trades that have motivated and inspired us along the way of creating our own business, River Road Brewing and Hops. I'm your host, Nikki Andrew, the original River Road Blonde, and this is Down River Road. Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of Down River Road. It's been a little bit. Um, we're trying to get these things rolling so we can do these on a regular basis. And luckily I've had a great crew working with me, thanks to Full Pop and the Stache for uh, being a great support. Today, I am welcoming a very, very special guest, award-winning producer, director, um, and amazing photographer, Brad Turner. Welcome. Thank you. It's great to be here, Nikki. It is fantastic to have you here. Um, I don't know if you know this, but, oh, I've known you since I was a little kid. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, my father was friends with you growing yep. up. Yes. I don't know the whole story. I just remember my dad saying, oh, I know this guy, his name's Brad, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, he, he was a little older than me and not much, though. I'm no. about we're the same late age. Yeah, like around father. the same age. Yeah. And I think I met you probably first when I was like little, like five or six. I was quite small. And then right. again, when I was a teenager, and I remember it being influential because at the time I was like, I'm going to be a director when I grow up. I don't know if you know that about me. <laughs> That's fantastic. <laughs> yes, but of course it didn't come into fruition. I did, uh, I applied to Beale. I was going to go to Beale High School, which oh, yeah. I know you're, yep. you're very familiar of. with. Yeah. Yep. Yep. You graduated from there. That's correct. Yeah. Um, and then uh, things, plans changed, obviously, and I didn't follow down those routes. But it was really interesting to me to learn about, like, as you were progressing in your career, dad was definitely watching what you were doing and how you were evolving. And it was really just neat to hear all the different stories growing up. Right. Some of them interesting stories from your youth. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, of course. I mean, Bayfield is a great place to grow up. I mean, you got to be a, you got to be a kid there. I uh, grew up in a good time you know, in my life where uh, we weren't consumed by, um, you know, all the internet and social media. And, uh, and we weren't even that in, we really weren't that influenced by television either. Um, I remember when, when I was I was at Central here in high school, and uh, <laughs> yeah, Central, uh, exactly. <laughs> yes. um, and uh, here in uh, in Clinton, and uh, I was I had to choose a major because mm -hmm. I was only I was in the four year program. I was just I was just like my father. I was basically a mechanic, and that's all I really wanted to do. Intellectual work wasn't wasn't my thing. Yep. Um, I remember we were forced to take French and I rebelled amazingly against it. <laughs> uh, I wish I hadn't, but I did. And um, I was forced to take a major. So I was like, okay, I like all of this stuff. I'm going to do sheet metal, sheet metal and welding. That's what I'm going to do. Um, at the time, fortunately for me, my sheet metal and welding teacher pulled me aside and said, you don't want to do sheet metal and welding. <laughs> I said, oh yeah, yeah, that's what I want to do. Because uh, I'm good at welding. My yep. bead is like perfect. And, Which is uh, hard. Yes, yeah. it is. It is. Yeah. Dave would know that. I know. <laughs> um, <laughs> I hear it all the time. <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, and there's two types of welding, of course. There's electric welding and then there's, uh, you know, the one with gas, which is, you Make know. welding. And I was good yeah. at both of them. But anyway, uh, he said, you don't want to do that. And I said, well, I don't have any other choice. So he said, I think you're, um, I think there's a program in London, Ontario that is doing, um, there's, it's like a media program uh, for television. And I was like, oh, okay, that sounds interesting, I guess. And he said, it's more, I think it'd be more fitting to you. Somehow he saw that I was more wow. creative than I was yep. um, mechanical. Even though I am mechanical, I, I had that bent. And he also saw some confusion in me wanting, you know, knowing my future and somehow read it. And he was... Um, Which is an he, amazing teacher. Exactly. Yeah. And I... And I remember to this day when he said, uh, there's this program at Beale Tech, there's only two in Canada, and it's, a, it's television, it's about television, radio and television. And I said, oh, really? That sounds interesting. And he says, why don't you look into it? So my mom, who was a school teacher, she looked into it. And as it turned out, because Clinton didn't offer it, I could go tuition free yeah. to London to do this course. So we... Somehow made it happen. 
I remember one of the first questions the instructor asked me was, what's the difference between video and audio? And I got it wrong. So that's where <laughs> I start. That was my, my, my start. And, um, and I thought I was going to go for TV repairs. I didn't realize I was doing <laughs> production. And, um, but as it turns out, one thing led to another, and it turned out to be a very positive thing for and me. You were good at it, obviously. Yeah. Y yes. <laughs> <laughs> Pat yourself on the back. Um, yeah, so when I was going to go, it was similar. There wasn't a lot of programs at Central Huron for, um, well, and there was arts, but it wasn't like really a big thing there. Um, so my art teacher at the time recognized my need for um, being artistic mm -hmm. and was really pushing me to put together a portfolio to go to Beale. And I did go in, but I had to have like a full on interview because they weren't accepting new students from outside of the district. Um, so I remember it being intense. Like I sat with a board basically, and here's my portfolio of stuff that I've made. And the, But I got accepted. I just didn't, I was, didn't have the opportunity to go. But the programs there are amazing. And I remember walking in the, in, down the halls at Beale, coming from Central Huron, and like everybody's kind of doing their own thing. And they're like, oh, we're going to go for a coffee break. And I'm like, what? What? <laughs> you get to leave the school? <laughs> I don't understand what's happening. And it was in the photography class that I really got to know some of the students there. And they, it was just such a relaxed, enjoyable atmosphere for somebody that enjoys the arts. Yeah, I, th I think that uh, to this day, I remember all, all the teachers there. And what, one of the things that did happen to me, which was kind of unique, because uh, the educational television um building was literally right next door to yeah. Beale near to the art school and um when i when i worked there they were just believe it or not cable tv was just starting and and one you're of aging them, yourself exactly <laughs> yeah. but that's okay. that's okay one of one of the mandates of cable television was that you they had to have public access access programming and so uh in my second year in grade 12 i not only got a part-time job at ETV Center Which is working. Yeah. I also got a part-time job at the um, at the local cable station, paid, and they're both paid positions. And then when I graduated, I actually got the full-time job at the ETV Center. So I worked there for a year, and so so I was very close to educational television for the three, the two years I was in school and the year I worked uh, at the ETV Center. So it was. It was a great uh, start for me. Absolutely. And having that encouragement to push push you in that direction. I mean, kudos to whoever that teacher was that yeah. knew that or saw that in you that knew that's the direction you should head in. Yeah, there's no there's no academically, there's no clear path to the job I've done over the years. There's no it's not really it's not really like you go and you spend five years in, you know, medical training and then you no. you go into a hospital and you intern and the, Nothing like that in the entertainment, in the film television business. It was literally, it's kind of like being on a river going out to the lake. Yeah. And you sometimes hit a rock and you're delayed slightly. And then all of a sudden, well, you're either going to right or left. And, yeah. and the current takes you that way. Um, there's been so many crossroads in my career in terms of like my journey that, um, you know, often I talk even, even after, um, just before I went on to 24, I was uh, approached to do Alias. And um, the same job, the producer-director job, was my first producer-director job. Um, uh, I was doing an episode of Alias. I'd already done a ep couple episodes of 24, and then I'd gone on to do Las Vegas and a few other television shows, which was my first time in Los Angeles. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere... They were offering me the producer director on the final job, our finest season of Alias, and and then the guys at Twenty Four heard it, and I'd worked with them before. The showrunner, the guy that runs the show, said, uh, "Well, no, we're going to have you a producer director on this show." Yeah. And so I had two offers, and I'd only been in Los Angeles for one year, which is amazing. And I had these two offers on these shows, but at the time were very big shows. Yeah. Uh, Alias was actually bigger than Twenty Four because yep. Alias was a was on before 24. So I went to a writer friend that pr produced a show I did in Vancouver and we had lunch and I said, what do I do? 
Right. And I remember what he said to me. He said, well, with Ilias, you're not going to win an Emmy. With 24, you're going to win an Emmy. Yeah. And? Yeah, exactly. He <laughs> was smart happened. and he was wise, yes. Speaking of that, so you, you worked for quite a few years on 24, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, there, you were there for quite some time. Yeah, I did. Um, I, was, I started full-time season five and went five, six, seven, and eight, yeah. directing 10 episodes a year, which is like unheard of these days. You would right. never do 10 episodes no. of anything unless you were doing – a miniseries that was 10 episodes all together as a big movie. We were just having this conversation the other day about how, um, so I've been kind of re-watching some of the old TV shows that I used to watch because we have the ability to do that now. Mm-hmm. Um, and li- like watching, you know, thinking I'm going to be done a season after 10 episodes or eight episodes. And I'm like, wow, this is, there's like 50 episodes in one season. And I don't know Not what f- happened there. What was the... You'd have to, uh, the the standard was 22. Yes. Yeah, well, I was being um, sarcastic. When I did, we did 24, obviously it was yeah. real time for yeah. one day. So it's 24 ep- episodes. And then I remember when I did the first season of Hawaii Five O, they added two episodes onto our 22 episode order. So we did 24 episodes right. there too. But that was, a, that was not, that was a very much a CBS thing to, to add episodes on so that they could run a bit longer. But you are right. There are certain shows that I didn't work on, but have, are legendary for one of the one of the shows. And I always forget the zip code, but everybody knows this show. And I don't. I didn't watch it. Nine two one zero. Oh, nine zero two one zero. Nine nine zero two one zero. I love that. Um, I love that you think of that. Uh, I know. I've worked with a couple of the actors on that show, and and one uh, one guy told me a great story. He said. We were all so young and at that point in our life where you would go, there's no way one of these kids is going to go off the rails. Yeah. And it was, and I want to say it was Luke, uh, what was his name? Luke, uh, Luke Perry. Luke Perry. Yeah. I did a TV series with him in Vancouver and we got along fantastic. He's unfortunately gone now, yeah. but um, he was the most wonderful soul that I've, that I've met for a long time as, a, as an actor. And he said, what happened was Aaron Spelling decided that um, they were getting some momentum from the show. And he decided that he would do, and this is to answer your 50 episode question, <laughs> that he decided that he would, because the show was doing really well and he had all these young actors were exactly the wrong age to beh- yeah. behave themselves in Hollywood, he put them all in his house. So all of those actors so lived in his them. house. Yeah, smart. And what he did was he said, I'm just going to keep shooting. I'm not going to have seasons because we'd do 22 episodes and then have a hiatus. Yeah. And then you'd be off for three months and then you'd shoot your other 22 episodes because it would take approximately eight months to shoot 22 episodes because it's seven or eight episodes a, yeah. a, or a days an episode. And so spelling in his wisdom, and again, this is not my, this is not first person. This is through Luke. He said, we all went in the house, but he let us party. But the point was, we couldn't get out the gates. But in control. And remember, he had this legendary mansion that was, you know, twice as big as yep. the Playboy mansion. So these guys had parties. They could bring friends in. They could do anything they wanted, but they couldn't leave the grounds. So he could literally get up in the morning and pluck them. Wow. Out in their drunken stupor, yes. and take them and to the you are stage. Filming now. Yes. And they had three or four stages because at the time, Aaron Spelling wasn't a, bi- a major studio, but they would rent space in one of the lots. So they had six stages. And Luke said, I would literally be going from episode um, 704 oh, wow. to episode 706, and then back to episode 708. And he said they had this great machine where they could take their actors and just move them around. And he said, it was the worst and best time of my life. I he said, say. I've never had more fun, but, that but would I've be never intense. worked so hard. Oh, yeah. yeah. That would be incredibly and I think they intense. did, if I'm not, you know, I'm probably not completely accurate on this, but they did like about three years where they never stopped working. So Aaron was smart enough as a, as a movie mogul and TV mogul to go, okay, I'll just keep him here. I'll keep him working. They will not be misbehaved because they will have no time off. Yeah. And, and it worked perfectly, but Luke has fond memories of it. So it's not like it was an abusive situation. No, it was would, actually it, it would become positive. your family, really. You're yeah. just with your family all the time. 
Yeah. That's intense though. Like that's an yeah, intense that's, way of working. But that but then the uh network that's how it became so hugely popular because what the network did was just keep airing episodes. It never it didn't it didn't have a hiatus where they do reruns. It's funny because I didn't even think about it. Nobody that. no I wasn't even aware of it. What they did was they did not have a summer hiatus for 92010 whatever the They just kept going. They just kept going. That's what made it hugely popular. Because there was and no, you didn't have to wait for another. You just no. kept watching it and watching it. And watching all through it. the summer. Like a soap opera, kind of. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. All through the summer, no hiatus. And I guess maybe that's where Aaron got his idea from. Yeah. Is just, why don't we just like, soap, soap opera, just keep going. Just keep going. And but it makes the, sense because look, look at the dedicated fans you see to soap operas. Like there's some pretty intense yeah. fan bases out there for different soap operas. But I, I always thought that was a great idea. I've Smart. never instituted it, but because I, I want the time off. Just to say, do you want people living with you? Is that like no. to monitor people all the time? But his house was so big that it you would, wouldn't even. It's know. probably the size of a hotel. Yeah. I mean, it's sold now, but it's. But uh, I've driven past it, and it's pretty much a couple of blocks of city, and it's like it's got everything in there, and, and he oh, had sure. every, all the kids living there. That's and insane. that's how his daughter got on the show. Story, it, right? Yeah, yeah, because he was hanging yeah. out. She was hanging so out with the cast. I'm having to like really dig back into the memory oh, yeah, bank yeah, to yeah. remember all these people. <laughs> yeah, but well, Luke I'm was Luke was the salt of the years. And Jason Praisley, I did, I've done a couple of episodes with him, and he's amazing too. I met him once somewhere. I can't yeah, remember he, where. Yeah, he's he's just regular dude. Yeah, really nice, really nice person. So you worked on 24 for quite some time. Um, was the Shannara Chronicles before or after that? Because you uh, worked on well the Shannara Chronicles. It. Yeah. Well after that it. was pretty interesting. I uh, so. Brad's wife and I, Jess, are very good friends, and I hear little bits and stories of different things that are have happened in their past. And Shannara Chronicles was a pretty intense because you had to travel quite a ways away to. Yeah, we went to the Southern know. Hemisphere, yeah. New Zealand. Yeah, it's a it's a world away yeah. because you literally sit in a plane for I don't know nineteen hours. Way too long. Yeah. Over water. Yeah. Going, what is it, three, four hundred miles an hour? Yeah. <laughs> Super exciting. I don't fly well, so. <laughs> it's, uh, it's an eye opener. It's not where I'll be going. Thank you. <laughs> have a good night's sleep. Yeah. And you wake up and you're in another, uh, what feels like a totally a different place. But anyway, we did two seasons of Shannara Chronicles, um, both six months long in New Zealand. Uh, wonderful people. G- great. Nothing's familiar in New Zealand. Like no. there's no, none of the. None of the things, funny story about New Zealand where um, we're talking to the crew and we're talking about all organic food. And they said, what's, what's, what do you mean by organic? Probably I said, the food that they eat. organic food. And they go, not sure about that. So we did a little research, talked to a few people. I said, everything's organic here. Yeah, exactly. They don't allow any, any of that uh, bioagriculture. Yeah. It's not allowed. And when you did more research into it, European, most European farms are are naturally organic they're not they don't use bioagriculture anywhere in fact it's uh it's an export that we're in right? north america we do and it's quite it, interesting it's a it's an eye-opener and i'm sure you know all about that being uh, i'm following farm. sheep farmers and stuff from um the uk um australia and new zealand just mostly new zealand it's really interesting to see the way that they they farm versus the way that we farm yes yeah it's pretty intense and it's um I don't know. They all seem like healthier people. I, that's probably yeah. just, they're also a very active lifestyle. Yes. Um, so you see differences there for sure. Um, one thing that it was funny, my daughter and I were kind of, I was just doing a little research because of course I've followed different things throughout your career and just watching um, all the different episodes and stuff that you've filmed um, of different TV shows and such. Michaela was watching with me and you know, my daughter, Michaela, mm-hmm. and she's like, he worked on MacGyver. <laughs> <laughs> and she literally was she's gonna kill me for saying this because she's she loves it when i talk about her on film but she was she's like did he get to work with and i'm gonna forget his name the the new macgyver but you worked on the yes. old macgyver too didn't no you? i didn't oh i thought I was you actually did. Yes. the old macgyver was being produced while i was living in vancouver and oh, i knew no. a lot of people that worked on it but it was was that the like the beachcomber era yeah yeah it was during beachcombers yeah. um we were we were Canadian directors and we weren't accepted by the U.S. networks because we were Canadian yeah, directors. Yeah. You had to be a U.S. director to do the original MacGyver. Yeah, uh, which but, is an interesting kind of take. A lot of people don't understand how that. Yeah, it was back then. It was it's different. It's different now, obviously, but it is different. It's only different for one reason, and that is credited to Canadian content and what and and the tax relief that U.S. producers get coming up here. Yeah. 
uh, when that started, uh, it was, uh, it, it was a, you know, for people who are like, you know, against government incentives and stuff, one of the things that Canadian content did for the arts uh, is is understated. It's like amazing what they did, especially in the film and television community, because everybody that's working now, even in Canada in the film and television community, uh, sh- should be credited the original Canadian content rules. It started in music, and it it made it made stars of our musicians here in Absolutely. Canada. And then as it turned into a more film and television uh, direction, it changed the the scope because I was around when I was shooting, you know, shows like Beachcombers for CBC as working on Street Legal and all of those yeah. things as a director. And um, none of those credits counted when MacGyver, the original MacGyver was being produced in Vancouver. As soon as it started that, oh, I get a, I get an incentive, a financial incentive as a studio in the U.S. if I hire a Canadian writer, right. a Canadian director of photography, a Canadian actor, a Canadian director. All of a sudden, that adds to my financial benefit. Yeah. Let's start looking at them. Yeah. And basically, that's how it starts. It wasn't, it wasn't a creative thing. It was a business decision. Yep. And uh, it allowed us as, um, as artists to start working in that in, in the US system. And virtually everybody that before me and that followed me that's now working in the US and had, had gained some success in the US owes it to uh, the Canadian content rules yeah. because basically the tax incentives and stuff move move our artists into a different stratosphere because they get noticed. And it's all, it's all about getting noticed. I mean, it's usually everything that you do is based on the film you produce or the film you direct mm-hmm. or the film you write but you have to get people to notice because there's a lot out there so yeah you have to get people to see what you're what you're doing and what you're about um let's break into these beers sure first of all so i picked zesty farmer because this is your favorite beer isn't it that we do yeah yeah um nice we've timing. had zesty farmer on here a bunch of times because it seems to be everybody's favorite beer thanks david for making such an awesome beer yeah, what makes Zesty Farmer so, so good? Zesty Farmer is um, a pale ale, so a really easy, smooth drinking beer. But we add fresh lemon zest to the Bright Tank as we're carbonating the beer. So basically what that does is uh, it gives it that citrus punch that you would get from a hop, say, without having the hop. So it has a little bit of bitterness to it, like an IPA would have. Cheers. But um, not as much. It's And it's fresh citrus. These were just canned here today for you, Brad. Wow. For you I'm specifically. Glad to hear you're yeah. canning again. <laughs> exactly. I was like, I need a zesty <laughs> I'm, farmer. I'm hanging on the canning part. Yeah. <laughs> for me, whatever. But yeah, so that's been David's finally canning it. nightmare lately is just uh, yeah, trying to get everything canned and organized for the summer. And we fell far, far behind, but now we're catching up again. So mm-hmm. thank goodness. So I want to talk about, uh, so we, we kind of t- just touched a little bit about you growing up in Bayfield. Um, and I, I've heard stories from my dad, different things that were, you know, I've heard very interesting stories from when he was a teenager about all the trouble that he caused. And I remember some story about a mock funeral down Main Street for the mayor at the time. And he got himself into some trouble. I don't know. You probably weren't around for that. I wasn't around for that. <laughs> yes. But um, they were doesn't creative. surprise me. No, exactly. Yes. <laughs> they were very creative. So you grew up in Bayfields. Mm-hmm. I knew your mom... I, I, well, I've, your mom lived down the road from my grandma, so I spent quite a bit of time on that street, yeah. so I met your mom quite a few times. Then you went to school at Beale. Yeah, I went, I went grade 9 and 10 were in Central Huron, and then I, then I went and lived with a bunch of, a bunch of um, friends that were going to Fanshawe, so they were oh. all college students, and yep. I went and lived with them. Going to high school. Going to high school. Yeah. And uh, hitchhiked home every weekend you hitchhiked i hitchhiked <gasps> from london ontario wow. to bayfield danger, every danger. weekend and yeah. then back sunday night to london to get to go to, to, go school. to school good for yeah. you uh, That's dedication. i mean unheard of these days my I mean, kids complain about having to bike into bayfield from our place <laughs> i'll remember well, to tell them that story when you're when your kids uh, graduate grade 10 can you imagine allowing them to hitchhike no. to london? there you go <laughs> <laughs> not at all but i, mean, I do know like uh, even when I was a teenager, hitchhiking wasn't such a big deal. No. 
that people did it all the time. And I don't know, I guess maybe we just became more aware of how dangerous it can be. I, I'm not sure what happened there. If it is dangerous. Yeah. We I don't, don't even know. I mean, in this part, these parts, I wouldn't think about that. But but I do know that one of the my my major sources of transportation were truck drivers. That's yeah. usually who picked me up. Yeah. <laughs> It was just like one of those things. And it's it was very complicated, too, because I had to go from, from here over to, through Varna to Brucefield. Yep. And Which then is, most people weren't turning to go to London. If you don't know this area, like that's, what's well, about an hour? No, it's more than an hour's walk. How long would it take you oh, to yeah, get from I, here to? I, I don't think I ever walked. Because there's uh, not a lot of traffic that goes from here to Brucefield no, or Varna. But, like, but again... I grew up in a period of time where hitchhiking was a was Fair. normal, and yeah. I live in, in Indianapolis now. But when I was in LA, it, you, you would always look at your watch when you're leaving because if it was anywhere near a school pickup time, you weren't getting anywhere. You weren't going to get anywhere because yeah. yeah. everybody's picking one. Every car picks up one kid. Yeah. So you're literally talking about 60, 80 cars on the street. Yeah. All trying to pick up a child at the same time. Yeah, so they, you'd you'd have to avoid wherever the school zones were. We were talking a bit at home about um, how we, like, how we reintroduced ourselves to you or how we, and we were talking about that commercial that you did, which was amazing. So you were helping out, um, well, in your way, you were helping out by making these little commercials during um, COVID. And uh, I don't know how we got connected, but somehow we got reconnected, probably Leanne and Sean. Um, and you came out and you did this, uh, like, a short film about um with with your awesome truck that it's gone it's gone which makes me very sad <laughs> somebody else is enjoying it I, that's how i look yeah at it. that's right that's yeah. right and you have a new vehicle now which yeah. is even cooler than the truck kind of once i get it running still, properly. I'm st- <laughs> <laughs> delve into your mechanical years yes exactly <laughs> yes, exactly um but during that time during all of that covid nonsense like all the crazy that was happening during covid you decided to make a movie yeah, in Bayfield. Yes, yes, we did. <laughs> it's good time. Well, getting back to the little promos, it was really interesting because we had, Jess and I had, I'm, you probably have never seen it, but Jess and I did a film for a, a film festival that one of her friends produces no. every every year. And, and what happens is he does a, an online film festival. This is before COVID, an online film festival of all of his friends that are in the horror genre. And <laughs> they make homemade um, short films, and Jess and I used the red truck and acted in this little this horror awesome. film. No, I haven't seen it, you but now I'm going to see it because <laughs> she's the victim, and I'm the you know. Aggressor, oh, this of is course. hilarious. Okay, you have to see it. I will see it <laughs> anyway. So we did this footage for this you know, truck driving down country roads and stuff, and um, and then you know, in Bayfield, everybody goes to restaurants. There's mm-hmm. no takeout really. There no. wasn't before. Before Not before the, COVID, before really. COVID. We didn't really take things and, home. Um, and then it was like everybody was able to uh, survive if they offered, you know, takeout. So there was a whole new mechanism where you called yeah. or you went on the internet or however the, the individual business set it up. And then we were trying to patronize all of them. Yeah. Then, so we would drive the truck over and pick up. And it started with Leanne and Sean's yep. um, shop bike. Jess and I both put our heads together and said, well, we're we're not doing anything. Could we do something? And we, we said, well, we're not, it, it's fit, like take 15 seconds. And basically what it is, is us leaving from our farm in our truck, yep. having ordered something at this, whatever it establishment is, but they'd all be the same. So the truck pulls up, the person comes out with the order, Puts it sets the it on the truck. back. Cause it, it, what used to, you had to open the trunk or something and they put it in. So there's no contact. And uh, so I said, well, just put it in the back of the truck and we'll do, a, we just yeah. do those three, use the same shot of them coming and going. It was perfect. And then, uh, and then have whatever product it is coming out and then put their ID at the end of it. And it's like 15 seconds long. So we would produce them. Uh, Ryan Malcolm did the music yep. for it. Um, he, he wrote and, and performed something for us. And they're all all the same music and all the same ending and beginning. Yeah. <laughs> and but it was the pro- different product, and we just gave them to everybody. And, and they were amazing. Yeah. Like and, it's it's a really cute little. Yeah. Like it's what it's a typical commercial. Like it's a bit longer than a normal yeah, commercial. Yeah. But, but it's but it's nice that thematically it's all the same. It's yeah. just the 
red truck going to different places. I loved it. We've, and everybody was so happy to have it done. And, yeah. And I have to, I'd say, piece of way the square. They were so thrilled. They and they, there was something about those guys. They yeah. just, they they were just so excited, and yeah. they said they'd never got so many hits on there. Yeah. <laughs> It was crazy. It was big. Yeah. It was a big thing. And people so we recognized were, it as soon as they like they were they were like, Oh yeah, I saw that for a shop bike or I saw that for and I was like, This is a really cool idea just to have that ability to just, you know, well, we're sitting at home. We can exactly we can do that right yeah, now. Yeah. Right. Um and luckily we got to take part in that because that yeah, was a lot of fun. It was great. And then David got to have his directorial debut and he thought he was the director's there assistant. You go. Yeah, exactly. It was great. <laughs> a little busy, a little busy for that, but yeah, that's okay. That's okay. So I want to talk about, um, you did the film, uh, trigger point, which is kind of what I want to get into because I know how important it was for you to bring your hometown into something that you do for a living. You wanted to make sure you film something in Bayfield. Yeah. It start. it started with the, the movie. It's like, uh, you, you know, as a director, you get assignments, you get, yep. you get relationships with, mm-hmm. you know, studios and they, and they hop, hop this project. This is sort of the genesis of the of that project was uh, I knew a studio executive who said we want to make uh, a low budget action movie, and um, you know it's going to have we're going to try to find a, a star, and uh, sort of worked like a, a franchise around them. And I said, yeah, I'd be totally interested in that. So uh, we sat together in Los Angeles and we came up with a with a, like an outline for the movie, which I had some input in. And then uh, it went to the writer and the writer wrote it. And when it came back, it came back with this, um, in the script, it had this small town in it. Yeah. And uh, so we originally did the survey. This is pre-COVID. We did a survey and uh, the loc- and we went to Toronto and I'm, I'm like, okay, this is all good. Because... It's interesting when you make a movie, you make it three times. You make it once when you shoot it or write it. You make it another time when you shoot it, and you make it again when you cut it together. Yeah. There's three different movies. You you really don't know, like from the outline to the to the script. Changes they're two all different time. movies. Yeah, and then as it goes along. So never in my did I ever have Bayfield in mind because one of the things about low budget movies is you have to find a place where you can do it at the the best possible rate. And one of the things about going to a place like Bayfield, so out of the the zone of possibilities for um for small towns because when you're in Toronto you can you can go to Hamilton and then you can find a small town mm-hmm. or something a main street that looks like a small town. So it was it was not in on my radar. And then we we uh, started talking about it and it looked like it was going to be 5 days of shooting in the town and all of a sudden now it's a week so it's really contained as a week is- and what the ones we saw which were close to toronto weren't drivable for the crew right just because of what we needed and what was uh, film friendly so jessica my partner and i just was said well why don't we think about bayfield and they went oh no it's too far away like the producer said it's too far away and I said, well, it's contained. It's a week, and we can probably, you know, make arrangements with the local merchants, and there's things that, there's savings we could get that would offset the cost. Because right. crew, when they go out of town, they need per diem, they need a place to stay, and then it affects the shooting day when you come, you arrive, and then the shooting day when you leave. You kind of have to have a short day on Monday and a short day on Friday so they can drive back yeah, into the back zone, not home. But right. into the zone, which is whatever it is, three, I don't know, 10 miles from right. downtown Toronto or something. I don't know, something like that. And so once you start really getting into the math, you find out that if, if you can get the hotels at a decent price, uh, the premium is going to be whatever it is, get as many local people to pitch in and help out. Um, and, and the Actors Union has rules too. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so... What I did as a, a director, I remember, I remember the day Jessica and I pulled up in front of Shop Bike and said, "If somebody's going to make a movie in Bayfield, we're going to be the first people to do yeah, it." Yeah, absolutely. Because this is an opportunity where everything aligned. You yeah. know, it's like a typical stars align yeah, thing. Absolutely. Where I said, 
I don't even have to do a location survey because I know exactly where I'd shoot everything because I know I I roam this place forever <laughs> in my youth. Yeah. I know every nook and I know cranny every in back the place. Street. Yeah. And um and we rewrote the script for Bayfield. So we literally, you know, could believe it or not, one of the one of the funny things that happened was there was a bookstore in the I never changed that in oh, the that's script. Neat. There yep. was a bookstore. And every place we surveyed outside of the Didn't GTA, no, we'd have to make a, a, a used record store into a bookstore. We'd have right. to use a, 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 a shop that was selling T-shirts into a bookstore. So that, again, factors into the math mm -hmm. that we had a bookstore <laughs> that was a bookstore. Yeah. <laughs> and it was like across from a restaurant that would work as a diner. And all of those things factored into it. And it was, it was more me selling it to the producers and the production. And then in the end, you know, when I look back on it, this was probably more inexpensive than what we would have done yeah. if we would have gone to a place just outside of Toronto. So it's really interesting uh, that there's a, there's a process of re-educating people and the way they think. It doesn't all have to be within the Toronto area. It can, there's so many really cool spots in even just Ontario that you could film at yeah. as long as you can make it make sense financially well, as well as... Yeah, location-wise, yeah. Yeah, so the, and the parallel is, I think the parallel is what we learned during COVID, that we can, you know, for the most part, we could probably all work at home yeah. with Zoom and have the meetings yeah. and go online. And, I hate Zoom, but yep. <laughs> but, you know, that we could probably do it. And and one of the things we learned when we made Trigger Point was you can probably go to a place like Bayfield Somewhere and shoot local. a whole Christmas movie there. Absolutely. And it wouldn't cost any more money than if you did it in Hamilton, mm -hmm. which is the popular place to do that sort of thing. Jess and I were brainstorming already on that. So <laughs> just so you know, um, for me, I think what was the cool thing for me was watching how uh, enthusiastic the town was to see something like that take place. It wasn't just about filming. It was about including what you know as the town to be involved in what was, what was being displayed, um, which kind of gave that whole uh, visual of what even like I watched it knowing what Bayfield's like, but now an outsider can watch that and still know and still get that hometown feel of what Bayfield can actually portray and using local, local like villagers for being actors or in, involving them in some way that they feel like they've been included in it. And it was, there's a lot of people that were really touched by that. So that's something to be proud of for sure. Yeah, I hope so. I hope they felt that way because I I know that, uh, one of the super positive things were like uh, Jane Eastwood, who played the librarian. She she fell in love with Bayfield. She'd never awesome. been here before. Yeah. <laughs> she fell in love with it. Yeah. And she said to Graham, who runs Lake House, she said, I, if I can have that room, I'll be back every summer. Yeah. And I think he said, yes, you, this is your room. Yeah. So uh, it was it was great. All the actors loved it. But, you know, Colm Fiore, he loved it here. He had the greatest time. And again, he had never been to this part it's, of the world. So he didn't so even funny know to me here. Yeah. How many people come here and then like that had never even heard of us. And they come to Bayfield or Godridge, anywhere in this area. And they're like, oh, wow, this is like yeah. European almost. Like you feel like you're in a nice little coastal village that's, uh, it's tourism. Like it's touristy, but it's not at the same time. Like it has a definite hometown mm. feel about it. I've traveled pretty extensively yes, in my career yes. yep. and um i haven't seen really anything that compared in in terms of it's not everybody's taste no but if you if you're the type of person that would like something very controllable in your life that really relaxes you yeah. the combination of the town the town itself the proximity to the water and the lake yeah. the the views the high views with the western exposure all of those things are not common in many places around the world. No, I, you know, we travel and like we travel all over the place. Well, as, as much as we can now that we have a brewery, we don't get to travel as much. But when we go places, we, it's hard for us because you almost expect the same, I don't know what to say, like the same feeling when you go, like you're like, oh, I'm on vacation. This is exciting. And then I'm always like, hmm food's better at home <laughs> like, it's right. really hard you go out to a restaurant in Bayfield we were regulars at uh, pretty much all the, the restaurants in Bayfield and then I go away and I taste you know there's been a few five-star restaurants that I've been to that are absolutely amazing 
But still, I, you know, like that's the same quality that I can come home and have every day. So it's hard to go away and come back and be or go away and have that same feeling or feel like I'm on vacation because it feels like I'm on vacation every single day. That's, yeah, exactly. Exactly, yeah. exactly right. I have a funny story when I was doing season six finale of 24. I think it was six or seven. can't remember. But we were, our location was on, uh, was in Malibu. And Ooh. it was, um, what was happening was it was the, the we, we like to, finish 24 on a, the sun coming up for the new day. That was kind of what we tried to do all yeah. the time. And I remember we, we were using sunset at this location in Malibu uh, for the finale. And it was Jack coming up from the water and coming up and finding, you know, one of his love interests, you know, half dead in a bed or something like that. <laughs> but anyway, Sounds um, great. we were, we were, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We were sitting and we're waiting for the sun to go down for the shot we were doing over uh, the Pacific Ocean was face faces west. And we're waiting and the sun's pretty high and we're looking and I'm, I go over and it's a it's a property in Malibu that has a cliff. So Malibu goes along the beach and then it goes up to an area that's got a cliff just before Zuma Beach. And we're at a property, and I think the property was owned by the guy that owns Skechers Shoes or something. Wow. You know, it's Interesting. like... Interesting, yep. Uh, something like that, and we're sitting there, and it's a, a mo- it's a nice house, not he- you know palatial, and a guest house and a pool, and we're sitting there, and we're you know it's just crew, we're just sitting around waiting for the sun to go down, uh, to do the shot, and I casually said to the location manager, I said, so, like, how much does this property be worth? And he said, oh, somewhere between forty and fifty million dollars. Yeah, no big deal. And I said, and I immediately thought about Tile Street and <laughs> and Pioneer Park, and I go. It's exactly the same. Yes. A big body of water with the sun going Minus down. Minus the sharks. <laughs> yes. No sharks. You can, and it had a staircase going down to the beach. Yeah, perfect. So it was basically the same thing. I'm going, I'm going to go back and buy property yeah. because <laughs> it's the same thing. And it's really, really, really good yep. value. Compared to, yeah, and Absolutely. Clearly, that's become a reality is that the, the value will come to it. And some another person said to me, they don't make waterfront anymore. No. And they don't. They don't. And so that's it. Yeah. It's an interesting... And you know, like, even in Malibu, you can't walk down the street and go to our, you know, all those restaurants. and it, It's it's not comparable. It's no. a, and that, that was what... And the other thing about it is uh, you can't move on Saturday and Sunday in the summer. Because it's on the so PCH, because it stops. Yeah. It just stops. It's not like it's busy. It doesn't move. So, it, like, people don't realize what we have. It's like, yeah. you know, until you do what I did was travel around the world and realize, man, there's, there's just doesn't exist anywhere. And it's not even like you're you're on vacation because you're you're working while you're there. So you're living what their their basic work like what they're living on a regular basis. So you actually see the true picture of what's happening in all these different places. Whereas most of us are just vacationing when we go there. Yeah. yeah. So we're still in that like romanticized version of, mm. we're like, this must be normal. Yeah. Like, <laughs> it's, like spending it's nine months in Hawaii and you know, on Oahu right? and like living on Waikiki beach. And it's it all sounds great until yeah. you live eight months there. Yeah. And uh, you realize you're going back and forth to work and you're, and everybody's in a rental car, a convertible Mustang or something, yeah. with all the time in the world. And you have to get... And you're like, dang it! And <laughs> Yeah, and you and traffic jams uh, in Hawaii on, on the highway were constant. And hot. And, and it's, yeah. yeah. And it's, it, so it was, um, it was like a real eye-opener because, again, beautiful sunsets, but... Man, we get them every day. It's yeah. like we we don't even go down to to watch them. It's no, like- I I think over the last couple of years, um, especially uh, since we had a little bit more time over the last couple of years, we're not in such a rat race. Um, I've spent a little bit more time appreciating the village that I've grown up in because you know that I've spent pretty mm-hmm. much my entire. I mean, I got away. I moved to London. I moved to Stratford. Um, enjoyed my life there, but. I, wanted to come back like this was where I wanted to raise my children and to yep. grow old because it's such a beautiful place but when you're busy and you're working all the time it's the same thing here like we forget the, yeah. what we have here 
So over the last few years, I think, and even you've noticed it, because I know I've had the conversation with you before, you know, you come home and you're able to appreciate it a little bit more, um, hopefully this summer too, where you can actually go out and you can enjoy the sunset. You can take a stroll down the main street and really suck in everything that's that's there that we remember from our youth. Yes, And that's exactly. what I think it comes back to is like being young in Bayfield or I don't know, not, it doesn't really matter, I guess, any small town. Um you know, wandering the streets till the, the street lights come on or um, <laughs> even later sometime, going and having a campfire on the beach, yeah. uh, swimming at like 10 o'clock at night because that's the quiet time. Nobody's at the beach at 10 o'clock at night. You, As you get older, you learn to appreciate those things again. Yes. And it just kind of, it's like, oh yeah, that's why I loved growing up here because it was such a romanticized place to grow yeah. up in yeah to other people it was normal to us yes it's romanticized to other people on, yeah. on, on other standards that's what it is but it, it was it was like normal i mean somebody i heard somebody said that before um you know the modernization of bayfield it was all poor people lived there and i would like it was there was no i didn't know any poor people nope. we were poor we were the happiest people in the yeah. world we were the richest poor people ever but i didn't grow up thinking rich or poor that no. wasn't even a concept. Like we went to the neighbor's house and maybe they didn't, maybe we didn't have steak for dinner there. Maybe we had hot dogs, but it wasn't that we thought about what we were, that wasn't even a concept to no. us growing up. No, I, we had roast beef every Sunday. Yes. Yeah. And, <laughs> Same. And yeah. that's, <laughs> that I think is a rich person's meal. Yeah. Right. <laughs> you know, every Sunday it was kind of boring, but yeah. it happened. But when corn season came along, it was much better because I love corn. Because corn on the cob is the yes. best thing in the world. Oh yeah, yeah for sure. <laughs> so My uncle Mert had a, corn patch right beside our house so my mom would send me over three steps over that way to pick the corn so it was like yeah i guess and a lot of people would look at that as a romanticized where it was like just, just a, a normal, normal thing for me yeah. you know it's like yeah. and um and i'm happy that it happened and i know that i that, that i'm lucky it happened to yeah. me and i was able to to do that i i acknowledge that every day but yeah. but the reality is that's my reality and that's the way it works so um, when I hear people say that, uh, you know, there were less advantaged people in Bayfield, none of us were less no, advantaged. We I, were totally advantaged, yeah. way beyond, like maybe we didn't have a big library and, a, you know, a movie theaters. Or a and, shopping mall, which yeah, it didn't. And that's the thing. I hear that from people all the time. And I still see it from people that come in from the city. They're yeah. like, where do you shop for your groceries? And I'm like, well, I, I go to Foodland or I oh. drive to Goddard. It's oh. not like it's a... I didn't think it was a big deal. It's certainly not. But it's a big deal to certain people. That's I didn't funny. realize that was a thing. What? No Costco? Yeah, like I, <laughs> seriously, they they said, "Where's the closest Costco?" And I was like, uh, "London, I think. I guess I don't." Yeah. So I yeah. I think I when I was younger, I didn't. I, of course, when you're a teenager, you're like, "This is boring." I don't like Bayfield. And then you move away and you, you realize as you get older, this is silly. I don't think silly. that's maybe where we differed. I'm not sure I ever said that to myself oh, when I was a teenager. I, I did. Maybe because I was going to London every... Yeah, you had you all know, the excitement of London. There was nothing boring. <laughs> it was not. I had beach fires in the summer. That was my excitement. Oh, that's nice though. That's, yeah. That, yeah. What's next? What's coming up? Jess and I are... We're, we, what we want to do is we want to do more movies yeah. locally. We want to... We've talked to... Um, to several people about um, the potential of doing movies. And I, I'm moving more into the producing uh, side of things. And Jess is going to start doing more of the directing. So we're, we're seeing, we're seeing uh, pretty sure we're very close on making uh, movies locally. And that's what we'd like to do is set up a whole uh, system of doing it because of what we learned from trigger point was that it's not necessarily more expensive to shoot here. Yeah. It might be more expensive to shoot in the city. And it is here because we still get tax credits here. There's still a regional tax credit. So it's very similar to Hamilton. Right. It's not as good as the Northern tax credit, which, uh, you know, uh, I think uh, North Bay and Sudbury have taken advantage of. But um, it's uh, very, you know, it's it's enough that when, if we do it off season, not July and August, yep. off Trying season, season. we yep. can negotiate with the local merchants for, uh, uh, it's mostly comes down to hotel rooms. Yeah. Um, so we, you know, just Jessica and mm -hmm. I and Fopop actually mm -hmm. are um, looking to expand uh, our world and their world into more of what I've been doing for my whole career, which is, you know, 
saleable movies and television yeah. um, of the nerve kind, like telling stories. And um, we want to we want to concentrate on some local stories, but we'd also love to get into the Hallmark, you know, Christmas movie yeah. stuff because people love. I that. mean, we could literally uh, shoot in real snow as opposed to the fake snow yes. that they do in in Hamilton <laughs> you do it in or January. wherever. Yes, yeah, yes. yeah. For the year coming up. Yeah. Uh, but again, that's all. You know, it's all about. It's it's not really. Um, what you want to do and what you don't want to do. It's all about uh, selling people on the idea Mm -hmm. and then letting them, you know, letting it grow on them and making them aware. And Trigger Point really did step in the right direction. So on the... Oh, I think so, for sure. Yeah, on the the tales of the success of Trigger Point, we want to push it hard because, you know, eventually people will forget about that. Uh, They always do. I mean, they forget about... Everything. You know, the the way it works. It's whatever is new. So hopefully in the fall or early next year or something, we can produce something here, re-educate everybody as to how it works and the benefit for it. Absolutely. The last thing in the world we want to do is promote a film business that comes in, sort of goes through, because it can happen on my business. It can happen where they go through, they don't pay their bills and they leave town. Yeah. And then you just, you just feel have this empty feeling. Uh, I've never been personally involved in that, but I've heard lots of stories about that. So it's, it's something that, that that's why local people need to be involved. So like I was very vigilant on making sure that everybody got paid for what they were doing. And, and if we, even if somebody said, no, no, you can go shoot on her. I tried to say, we've got to do something for them, right. put their product on the, on the movie, whatever we're, we 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 got to do. Yeah. And uh, they were, were great at it. And, and most people, as long as you're not working for a major network that has product placement rules, which is means Coca-Cola, you couldn't have a, right. A Pepsi in the shot, if yeah. it was, you know that kind of thing. Um, they were they were they were really good. Where we were, our film and films is not as important as television. Uh, they were totally fine with it, and that's one thing the local businesses can Contribute take advantage to, of. Yes. Yeah, because we we used or you used our beer in the mm-hmm. um, bar scene or the diner scene, I think it was. Yeah, which was really neat yeah. uh, from a from my perspective. And we're still small; like we're we're only five years in seeing something like that and feeling involved in something like that is is a big deal it really yeah. is especially for for your local your locals i don't i hate calling people locals but you know what i mean yeah yeah of course yeah yeah, yeah. so that's the, that's what's coming up yeah that that and uh, you know i've got some assignments i've got a, a show for fox in toronto and i'm going back to do a show i did last year in halifax oh right yes i remember uh, called from yep and i think it's I think it's airing here, but I'm not sure. It wasn't when we when it originally. No, because I hadn't heard of it yet, and then yeah. I looked it up after you had said that. Um, Is it on Crave? Because it did, seems to be where I everything think, shows up. Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> everything's on Crave. I think I think Trigger Point's on Crave. It is. Yeah, yeah. it yeah. is. Because <laughs> that's where I tell people to go <laughs> <laughs> buy it or see it on Crave. Yeah. Um, they because uh, you filmed two episodes. How last many, year last year you filmed of 10 two. yeah i did two of 10 yeah and this year i'm doing two of 10 which as well. is amazing yeah and you you liked it out there i loved it out there and, yeah. and the show is fantastic because uh a, a dear friend of mine that i i did several i did episodes of the show called alcatraz and episodes of the last ship mm-hmm. with jack bender yep. who was the uh is the producer director and an executive Those producer on the show and he's like like a super guy he's just He's just the way I think is the way he thinks. So it's great to work with him. Yeah, it's important to work with people like that. Um, so that's exciting. So you're getting to that point now where you're kind of rolling back into Bayfield more and more. We're seeing you more frequently, which we love. Um, I do have to say before we kind of call it quits here, uh, how much I appreciate how much you and Jess pushed me in this direction. Because it was you and Jess that... Um, mentioned to me you should try doing a youtube video or something like that (laughs) and i was like "Ah, i could never do that and then i started doing it i was like i really love this so i felt kind of like when you were talking about your teacher in public or in high school when you were going to clinton that's kind of how you made me feel because i would never ever ever put myself in front of a camera before that and then i started doing it i was like this isn't so bad i kind of like this that's great to hear you're good at it too you (laughs) you feel totally relaxed and uh yeah and i've done lots of this Yes. In other situations. I'm not so. going to lie. I was nervous doing this one. <laughs> yes. 
No yeah. need. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, no, I'm not anymore. It's all good. Good. So I do want to thank you so much for joining us. Um, it's, it means a lot to me to have somebody that I've grown up knowing about um, and meeting a few times in my youth and then becoming such great friends with yeah, it's uh, great. In, the, in the immediate right now. It's so. my pleasure. And I, I, and I want to say congratulations on all your success. Thank I mean, you. doing thank you. Not, beyond the podcast and everything, the whole River Road Brewing Company and everything has become a big thing because my, my wife's family is from the U.S. and they love coming here. I and love your wife's love, family, I'm just saying. <laughs> but they love the, uh, you know, not only your product, but just, again, being, uh, feeling like part of uh, mm -hmm. Bayfield and not, and not just going to a place to, you know, buy some beer. And, yes. But, uh, you know, the whole contribution on the music side and, and uh, just the, the, the vibe out on that, they love, so... Everybody from whoever comes here, I'm sure, is the same. So congratulations on Thank your you. success. Thank you so much. Yes, and um, I hope we'll keep we'll keep being able to do this. Um, I look forward to what's coming up in the filming industry yeah. for you. And uh, congratulations again on a successful year. Thank you. And hopefully we'll see more successful years. In okay, the sounds good to me. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining me again for Downriver Road. We'll see you again for the next episode in a few weeks. Cheers. Mm -hmm.